Hello, welcome. This is the third session in a six part Zoom series in which we explore the concepts of community justice and use the Neighbourhood Justice Centre as our model. We opened in 2007 and we're Australia's first and only community justice centre and a world first international mentor community court. We sit within the Specialist Courts and Programs Division of Magistrates Court Victoria. And we've had many evaluations done over the years and compared to other magistrates courts, the NJC has proven its ability to reduce recidivism with offenders 25% less likely to reoffend. As mentioned in the video, there is an increased accountability with clients who are twice as likely to complete community corrections orders as well as an increase in compliance with intervention orders. And equally as important, the City of Yarra community has an increased confidence in the justice system. That's all from me now. I will hand over to Rachel to introduce our speaker today. Welcome. Terrific. Thank you, Alicia, and thanks very much for that uh, very good introduction to the NJC. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to introduce uh, the Honourable Rob Hulls to you today. Uh, Rob began his career in 1984 as a solicitor with, with what was then known as the Legal Aid Commission of, as of Victoria, uh, now VLA. Uh, after leaving uh, the Commission, Rob then in, entered a very impressive life in politics, which saw him serve terms in both the Australian Federal and Victorian Parliaments. As many of you would be aware, from 1999 to 2010, Rob served as the AG for Victoria. And during this time, he instigated significant changes across Victoria's legal system, one of which was the establishment of the NJC. In 2012, Rob was then invited to establish the Centre for Innovative Justice at RMIT as its inaugural director, a role which he continues today. So thank you, Rob, for joining us today and making the case for community justice. Over to you. Thanks very much, Rachel. Thanks for that introduction. And I too want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, and I pay my respects to their elders um, past, uh, present and emerging. Um, I always uh, sort of half smirk when that um, type of introduction is given to me, Rachel, because you talk about me having a, um, a federal political career for a short period of time and then a state political career. What you thankfully uh, didn't tell the audience was that um, after uh, three years in federal parliament, I got beaten by that Rhodes Scholar Bob Catter. Um, who's still there. So I'm the one to blame for Bob Catter being in federal parliament, everybody. I apologise to you all for that and indeed to the rest of Australia. Um, but uh, I guess we uh, are often shaped by our experiences uh, and our history. And my history really is that I came from a very large family, you know, seven kids. At one stage, mum had six kids un all under the age of eight, can you believe? And we used to sit around the dinner table at night and have very passionate social justice conversations. Um, and that sort of formed, in my view, um, my desire to do something in the social justice space to, to assist people who are uh, more, more disadvantaged than, uh, than me. And I thought law was a good way of doing that. Um, but you can't tell anyone this. My marks weren't good enough to get into law when I finished school. Um, in fact, they were bloody ordinary. Uh, and um, uh, I did... Uh, start an arts degree at La Trobe University, um, but desperately wanted to do law. And at that stage, RMIT Uni had a, a law course where you, you went to lectures in the morning, lectures at night, and you worked in a lawyer's office during the day, a very practical uh, undergraduate law course. And um, I, while I was at La Trobe Uni, stalked RMIT. I wrote to them every day, um, urging them to let me into their, their law course. And I know I stalked them because when I became Attorney General, I introduced stalking laws. Um, so uh, I kept writing to them and finally they said, stop writing to us. If you pass first year arts, there'll be a place for you in law at RMIT. And I did pass first year arts just, and there I was finally doing what I wanted to do, law. Uh, and, uh, you know, I found it pretty difficult, but finally I graduated as a lawyer and I thought I've got to use this privilege to make a difference. Um, and so that's when I did go and work for legal aid for a while. Uh, enjoyed that work, set up duty lawyer scheme down at Frankston, worked at uh, Broadmeadow, Glen Roy, uh, around the traps. And then I saw a job advertised working with an Aboriginal legal service in Mount Isa in North Queensland. Never met an Aboriginal person in my life. Didn't know where Mount Isa was, basically. 
Uh, at that stage, my parents were living on the Mornington Peninsula, in fact, Mount Martha. And I remember saying to my old man, I've applied for a job in, uh, in Mount Isa and I'm going to take it. And he said, what the bloody hell do you want to work in Mount Eliza for? I said, no, no, not Mount Eliza, Mount Isa. I had to dig out a map to show him where it was. And um, I went up there. Uh, I planned to go up there just for 12 months um, to broaden my social justice horizons, to see how the justice system operates in other parts of Australia. And I remember being greeted um, uh, at the airport uh, when I arrived and I was taken to a welcoming barbecue to welcome the new Aboriginal legal aid lawyer. Uh, and I remember at that barbecue, a police officer came up to me and said, oh, you're the new guy who's gonna do Aboriginal legal aid work. And I said, yeah. He said, what sort of work are you expecting to do? And I said, oh, you know, I'm here to represent, I had all the lines right. I'm here to represent the most disadvantaged members of our community. I'm here to make a difference. He said, yeah, 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 mate, you got the lines right. but." Um, the sort of work you're going to get involved in is uh, going to be quite frightening. I said, what do you mean? He said, so if I was to tell you that last night in the Mount Isa Watch House, an old Aboriginal bloke had been arrested just for being drunk. And while he was asleep on the watch house floor, the officer in charge of the watch house started force feeding him cockroaches as a bit of a laugh. And I sort of half smirked and I said, oh, you're bullshit. He said, you see, your reaction, one of disbelief, is the same sort of reaction the magistrate will give when the accusation is made before the court. The Aboriginal bloke won't be believed, but it happened. This sort of thing happens here all the time. That's the sort of justice system you're coming into, mate. You need to understand that. And by the way, I'm leaving town. I've had enough. And I didn't know whether he was just trying to scare the hell out of me, whether he was telling the truth. Um, I soon found out that uh, he was actually understating how bad things were. I can remember on my first golf trip, as part of my job, you used to have to travel in a light aircraft to the Gulf of Carpentaria, places like Mornington Island, Dumaji, um, places like uh, Cloncurry, um, you know, places like Normanton. And you would travel in this little light aircraft and it was like a traveling justice show. Some would call it a traveling justice circus uh, because on the plane was the magistrate, the police prosecutor and me, the defense lawyer, always sitting in the back of the plane. And I could often overhear the conversation taking place between the magistrate and the police prosecutor. And it was usually about what sentence they were going to impose on my clients before I got the chance to even represent them, interview them and get instructions from them. I'm not kidding you. And we'd fly to a place like Mornington Island and the system thought that you can just plonk something in a community and call it a court and people will respect it. So when the Mornington Island court sat, it actually sat in the Mornington Island police station and they would remove the sign police station off the building and replace it with a temporary sign called courthouse. And that was meant to be independent justice placed in this community. And I'd often take instructions from my client sitting outside under a tree because there was no interview rooms. And more often than not, as an afterthought, when my client wanted to plead guilty uh, and I'm taking instructions from him, a police officer would walk past and my client would say, oh, that's him. That's, that's the one. And I said, oh, the, the arresting officer. He said, no, 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 no. He's the one who pissed on me. And I'd say, what? He said, yeah, yeah, that happens here all the time. You get arrested by the police. They put you in the divvy van. They grab you out of the divvy van by your ankles. Your head hits the concrete. They take you into the watch house and they usually urinate on you. They piss on you. And he was saying to that to me sort of as an afterthought, not as though, you know, it was something that he was outraged about. It's something that always happened. Uh, so that's the sort of justice system I was coming into. One that was full of racism, uh, that didn't pe treat people with respect or dignity, um, but one that was also plonked into a community and it expected, that is the system expected people in that community um, uh, to uh, show some sort of respect for the system. It was appalling, just appalling. But instead of staying one year, I end up staying eight years eight years in that community. Uh, and I did Aboriginal legal aid work for five of those years and then realized that if the system is so bad, how do you change the system systemically? You've got to run for parliament. So I ran for parliament, got elected federally, uh, worked my guts out for three years up there, then got beaten by that Rhodes Scholar I spoke about and then um, decided to move back to Melbourne. Politics was in my blood uh, and I um, ran for the seat of Nidri, won that way back in 1996. We then won government in 1999, and I was sworn in as the Chief Law Officer of the State of Victoria, the Attorney General. Like, can you imagine what was going through my head at Government House when I'm sworn in 
as the senior law officer of the state of Victoria, and it, it's a swearing in ceremony at government house, very formal. Uh, all I could think about was Mark's not good enough to get into law. And now I'm the senior law officer of the state of Victoria. Oh my God. Um, how exciting is this going to be? Uh, and um, I used as a roadmap, everything I saw in Mount Isa uh, as, as my roadmap for systemic reform of the justice system. Uh, the view I took, particularly after seeing what I saw in Mount Isa, was um, you've got to design a justice system that can be a positive intervention in people's lives. Um, you, you can't uh, simply impose a system upon people uh, and expect them to have respect for it. Uh, people's lives go along a certain track and sometimes they might have ups in their lives you know, they might win Tets Lotto, I don't know, they might get their first job, buy their first house, and then there might be downs in their life. Uh, you know, there could be a death in the family, could result in mental health issues, drug and alcohol issues, substance abuse issues, long-term homelessness, long-term unemployment. And at that horrible stage in their life, they might come into contact with the justice system. Could be as a victim, could be as a perpetrator, could be as a witness, who knows? The view I took was at that pretty awful stage in their life, that contact with the justice system could either push them further into the mire, further uh, destroy their lives, if you like, or could act as a bit of a, a trampoline and bounce their lives back on track. And that's the sort of justice system uh, that I wanted to create. Um, and I learned that from what I saw in Mount Isa because the justice system I saw uh, was not a positive intervention in people's lives. It was a horrible, horrible disruption to their lives. There was no respect for that sort of system. Uh, and so that's why uh, when I became uh, Attorney General, I introduced a whole range of uh, um, therapeutic problem solving uh, courts and lists, uh, things like uh, the Curry Courts, clearly based on what I saw in Mount Isa. I mean, I remember at one stage sitting in the back of a court in Mount Isa waiting for my matter to come on. It was a coronial uh, inquiry. It was a single vehicle collision where a car had slammed into a tree in outback Northwest Queensland. The only witness was an old Aboriginal bloke. And I was just sitting there watching it. And this Aboriginal bloke looked around the court. He was called in to give evidence as to what he saw. And he saw all the white faces in court. He saw the white magistrate. He saw the white um, police officer assisting the coroner. He saw um, you know, everybody who was different to him, basically. And he was asked to give evidence about what he saw. And he looked around in a and I remember it as though it was yesterday, he looked around quite frightened and he said, I'll plead guilty. This bloke hadn't been charged with anything. He was there as a witness, but that's the view he took of our justice system. If you're an Aboriginal person and you're before Whitefellas Court, you must have done something wrong. Best way to get out as quickly as possible is to plead guilty to something. Uh, it was based on all those experiences, including that one, um, that I introduced Curry Courts uh, into Victoria. Um, and I won't you know, go on about the, the, the Koori courts, but they work, you know, where you actually have Aboriginal elders, respected people sitting with the magistrate, putting a cultural context to the reason why a person's coming before the court. I also set up specialist drug courts uh, here in Victoria because I knew that many, many people were coming before our courts because of a drug addiction. They were committing offences because of that addiction, but our justice system wasn't dealing with that addiction. It was just dealing with the end result of that addiction. I also set up a specialist family violence courts, uh, a mental health courts, the ARC list, assessment and referral list, a me mental uh, health courts, a sex workers list in the magistrates court. Also the court integrated support program, which is a um, basically a bail support program uh, to assist people who have these holistic uh, issues that need to be dealt with appropriately. Um, but all those specialist courts, as good as they are, and they have all been evaluated and they do work, they're all based on an existing court structure. Um, you know, therapeutic justice, uh, problem solving courts, uh, judicial monitoring, all based on the current court structure. Well then, um, some years after I had been sworn in as Attorney General, I went to a place called Red Hook in uh, just outside New York. Uh, because, you know, if you don't innovate in the justice system, you go backwards, that's the view I take. You've got to continue to innovate to make our justice system relevant to the people it's there to serve. And I met a fellow called Alex Calabresi, um, judge of uh, Red Hook Community Justice Centre. Um, and uh, he asked me 
about, you know, what I wanted to achieve as Attorney General. I told him about, you know, I want the justice system to be a positive intervention in people's lives and the like. And he got me to sit on the bench with him. And I vividly remember this one particular case where uh, a woman had been convicted of committing offences uh, as a result, really, of her drug addiction. And he was judicially monitoring her. She'd been off drugs for about six months. And he was bringing her back before the court uh, to see how she was going, to continue to give her hope um, in relation to uh, beating her drug addiction. She hadn't committed any further offences. But then I remember her mother was sitting up at the back of the court. And he made the observation um, to this woman, I think her name was Julie. Julie, isn't it fab fabulous how well you've done? And you would agree, there's no way uh, you would have been able to stay off the drugs as long as you have, had we not been able to get your mum into a program as well. And, and she agreed with tears running down her eyes. And I thought, hang on, her mum hadn't been charged with any offences, but how smart's this? This is actually dealing in a holistic way, um, in a, a, a sort of a, a community way with the um, whole plethora of, of problems that Julie had. And one of them was she was never gonna get off the smack uh, while her mum was a drug addict as well. And so this court process was able to assist the whole family uh, as part of a wider community. And I thought, this is really grassroots, place-based uh, justice. Um, and uh, if you have a look at the history of Red Hook and how it was set up, uh, Red Hook many, many years ago was a very dangerous place. There were gangs uh, all throughout Red Hook. Um, but there was, from memory, a local parish priest from a Catholic school uh, who used to assist kids, um, often of, you know, people who were carrying firearms to get to school and used to look after, after them. And then one day he was caught in a crossfire between two gangs and he was shot and killed. And that was a wake up call for the community. Their valued parish priest was shot dead uh, uh, during a, a, a gun battle caught in the crossfire. Um, and as a result, Red Hook was set up. It was the old Catholic school, lo local Catholic school, which the community wanted to turn in to a community hub where issues such as drug addiction, such as homelessness, such as unemployment could be addressed to bring the community back together. The community had fractured and this was place-based justice uh, that was there to serve the community. Um, and so I wanted, having seen what I saw over there to, to introduce a place-based scheme, a place-based justice model here uh, in Victoria. Um, and so I set about consulting very widely, uh, in fact, set up a, a community consultative committee. Um, from memory, I think Mary Polis uh, uh, headed that up. Uh, and there was a lot of consultation uh, with the community because community justice is indeed about actually talking with communities, getting them to identify the issues that need addressing um, and uh, get them to identify what needs to be improved to, to basically uh, strengthen their uh, communities. So the consultation took place um, over a long period of time and um, Collingwood, uh, the suburb was picked in the city of Yarra. And I um, went back and had a look at the second reading speech the other day uh, to remind myself uh, why Collingwood was picked. Because I remember we did look at a, a number of areas, but in the second reading speech, it says it pretty specifically. The city of Yarra is the ideal site for the Naval Justice Centre. It's a vibrant and progressive community which already has solid and innovative networks, programs and facilities operating throughout the area. The city of Yarra has also been one of the highest, uh, has also one of the highest crime rates in Victoria, with four of its suburbs represented in the top 10 postcodes ranked by offence uh, rate per 100,000 population. Further, areas in the city of Yarra experience significant social disadvantage, uh, with the Australian Bureau of Statistics ranking Collingwood third in the state. That's why we chose Collingwood. We wanted an area that did have high crime rates. We wanted an area that did have social dislocation and did have uh, social uh, disadvantage. Um, and Collingwood was chosen um, after broad consultation with the community via that uh, consultative committee. Uh, that consultation included traders, it included business groups, um, community groups, local agencies, uh, talking about better ways to solve their issues in a holistic way. The building that was chosen a bit like Red Hook, which was a building over there uh, that had been part of the community for a long period of time, was the old uh, TAFE site 
It had a history of learning in that area. It was a building that had always been part of the community. Um, and uh, it was chosen because of uh, the community and its belonging in that community. Uh, basically, the community helped design the fit out uh, of the building. Uh, when you go into the Naval Justice Centre, for those of you who, who haven't done it yet, you, you don't walk into a typical court building. You actually walk into a community hub. Um, you know, the same door that you walk in, all the staff walk in, including the magistrates, um, uh, walk in that same door. On the ground floor, uh, you might see, you know, kids from the local primary school. Um, I remember being there once and there was a, a Vietnamese women's choir, women's choir singing. Um, you know, there's art from the local community on the wall. Uh, the community had a say in the designing of the inside of the building. And the court itself, the courtroom itself, was deliberately put on the first floor, not on the ground floor. Uh, so it was not the main focus of this community hub. An integral part of it, but not the main focus. Um, but, but also, I guess, in an Australian first, uh, the community, or representatives of the community, uh, were actually on a panel that selected the magistrate, the first magistrate uh, at the uh, Neighbourhood Justice Centre. Um, and David Fanning is, is, uh, is still there. Uh, that had never been done before. Um, uh, but that was a way of absolutely getting the community to own this place-based resource. Um, unlike what I saw in the Gulf of Carpentaria, you know, uh, Mornington Island, where, where um, authorities thought you could um, plonk a courthouse in a police station and expect the community to respect justice, the Neighbourhood Justice Centre in Collingwood was actually born out of the community and nurtured by the community uh, for the local community. Um, and it works, you know, it works. As, um, as uh, has been previously said, um, recidivism rates have dropped dramatically uh, uh, at the Naval Justice Centre um, in comparison to offenders from uh, other courts with the same profile. Completion rates for community-based orders is much higher than the state average. Uh, offenders complete um, hundreds of hours of unpaid community work, um, much more than the, the, the state average. Crime rates in the city of Yarra have actually dropped since the Neighbourhood Justice Centre has been in existence. A um, whole range of specific crimes are down compared to uh, other areas of the state. Um, it is a, um, an innovation incubator, uh, as we've heard. Um, it is a, a very exciting place to work. Uh, the community has taken ownership of it. But not just that, it actually saves the community money. Um, you know, the last figures I saw, something like for every dollar invested neighbor, uh, neighbor justice center, um, there's expected return ranges between $1.09 and $2.23. And for every dollar the neighborhood justice center invests in community projects, attracts another $5.66 from uh, other agencies. And just as importantly, neighborhood justice center clients report very high levels of satisfaction with their experience of the neighborhood justice center compared to other courts. So basically the local community is taking ownership, ownership of justice in their local area. Um, so, uh, I, and I guess I, I sort of wanna finish on this note before we open up to questions. Um, my view very strongly is that this model should be embraced. It should be embraced by all governments right around Australia, it works. It works. Not only is it cost effective, um, but it is doing everything it was set out to do, reducing crime, reducing recidivism rates, and people are taking ownership of and um, showing respect for the justice system. What often happens around election time, and I know this you know, better than most, politicians like to stand on the front steps of Parliament House with their law and order baseball bat swing it um, you know, uh, as hard as they can and saying, vote for me, my base, law and order baseball bat is bigger than hers or bigger than his. Um, and um, politicians often think that that's what the community wants and it's gonna make us safer as a community. Um, in reality, it might make their seat safer, <laughs> but it doesn't make us safer as a community. All the evidence shows that smarter, 
holistic place-based justice actually works. It actually works. Problem solving approaches, therapeutic approaches, restorative justice actually works. And so um, if we don't wanna, as a community, end up spending more money on um, prison beds uh, than hospital beds and school classrooms, we have to embrace this approach. We have to base our policies uh, on the evidence, not just the scaremongering that usually takes place uh, around election time. So I think it is important that we embrace this model, uh, that the law and order tough on crime policies uh, that go against the evidence should be um, uh, discarded for this type of uh, holistic approach. Um, I'm very proud of the Neighbourhood Justice Centre, um, not just because I set it up, I would say that, wouldn't I? Uh, but but um, I'm proud of it because um, it is part of, or was part of my vision to make the justice system a positive intervention in people's lives. And on um, any way you measure it, any way you measure the Neighbourhood Justice Centre, it is that positive intervention. It's a fantastic model. Um, I've even told Alex Calabresi, I reckon it's better than Red Hook. Um, and uh, he doesn't disagree necessarily. Uh, I think we should embrace this approach. It works. Um, and uh, I think everyone in this audience today, I think has an obligation, a moral and ethical obligation to go out and give politicians, give the decision makers, the imprimatur to continue with this approach because it will make us safer as a community. It is cost effective, it works, and it is a shiny example of the justice system being able to be that positive intervention in people's lives. So thanks for listening.